We are live, sir. Good morning, Steve Wilson. This is Steve Batarian. We are uh, here at the Christ Center in Grand Junction, Colorado. We were hoping to show you some slides, some wonderful slides that um, included uh, ATP and aging. And Steve did a presentation last night uh, to a group of folks that uh, were at LaMed Medical Spa here in town. And uh, tell us a little bit about the presentation. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to share the slides, but I'll bet a man of your wisdom will be able to share that insight anyway. Well, it's nice of you to think that, Steve. Um, the, the whole thing started, obviously, they're in the skincare business, and we live in a world where things are topical. And, you know, whatever we do on the inside, we just can't have it show up on the outside. Is that fair? So, you know, they, they've, they're marketing an incredible product that really makes the skin look young. And so in, in my approach, the health of the skin begins from the inside. And the whole thing was based around oxygen. And I think it would be a fair position to take that without oxygen, there's death. Quickly. And it was, I mean, it was a kind of a jaw-dropping moment to see something that obvious. But this, say, if you don't get ox uh, oxygen to tissue, then that tissue begins to die. And what we do in America is we quickly cover it up because no one can look at dead skin. It's, it's not pretty. So uh, when we began down to, to, to look at the science, that if we could create vasodilation in the arteries and move oxygen, which is is tied up to iron. It has to be an organic iron. Uh, and, and this becomes an issue with people because they, they really don't understand the difference between organic and inorganic, particularly when it comes to nutrients. Organic means it's alive. And so a question that we could posture to people in your audience, do you know of any science that will support the fact that you could put something that's inorganic, meaning it's quite dead, and marry it to something that's synthetic, meaning it's not real, and create life. Oh. Uh, there's no science to support that, and yet that's what we do in America. We Can I interrupt for one second? Sure. You mentioned two things, and I think, um, uh, at least personally, um, I'm confused between the term organic we see in the stores for organic food versus inorganic food. Um, I know of organic vitamins versus inorganic vitamins, and you and I have learned that uh, in the past. Through, through ingesting and our bodies recognizing uh, live um, uh, minerals and vitamins versus inorganic and not live. But the, the world out here might not understand the difference between what is an organic vegetable and an inorganic vegetable and the statement you just made about things that are organic and inorganic as being alive and dead. So is it is it well, vegetables are grown in an in organic environment, meaning lack of pesticides and herbicides and things of that nature. If the, the botanical language is called a mycorrhizae process, okay. and it's, it's, it's an incredible um, science in that the root of the plant literally emits the amino acid into the soil and binds to an inorganic salt, say calcium or iron. And then that's drawn into the root system of the plant. And this is when science just, you know, we can see what happens, but we don't know how it works. But it's it's pulled into the plant system and then it's ingested into the the yeast of the plant wall. And it's within that yeast of the plant wall where we take an inorganic piece of rock and convert it to an organic nutrient, meaning it's alive. It's calcium that's alive, it's iron that's alive, and it's within that, within that scenario of the plant that if we just bypass the plant and eat the iron or the calcium is what people are buying on the shelf. And uh, the, the marketing gurus of the world recognize that it costs money to run it through the plant world. Okay, So what they've used is words like, well, it's liquid, or uh, we've chelated it, meaning it, chelate is a, a Latin word meaning claw, Greek word, I'm sorry, meaning claw, meaning it bound 
that mineral to a uh, sugar or an amino acid, but I call it painting. It's you, you take a rock and you simply paint it, and then something that tastes good. Well, like a sugar, and then you ingest it, and and then all at once everything changes because this this furnace that we have as a stomach rips this thing apart. Now you have a free floating rock plus the kilo. Okay. So all you've done is sold somebody uh, a rock. Okay. So that's probably a conversation <clears throat> for another day because we really want to focus on oxygen aging, ATP, um, and, and those effects. And I, I, I may have gone down a rabbit trail by bringing up organic or inorganic. Because um, I do think I, it is always my fault, Steve, and, and I'll take that um, daily. Um, but the, the goal here is, uh, my, my question there was to ask the difference between when you say organic and alive, when we see organic in the store, is it the same thing? And, and just because the spinach is organic in the store, does that mean it is somehow healthier than the spinach doesn't say organic? Well, you want to think that. You because want. it's grown in without the pesticides and herbicides. So this mycorrhizae process that we just tossed out is an interesting thing because if the plant is not healthy, this process will kill the plant on its own. It will kill itself and return it in back into compost into the soil and recycle it until they build a healthy plant. Mm -hmm. Then we ingest it. Now, what man has done is intervened with that with pesticides and herbicides so that they can grow this thing that has no food value but they can market it to you and I under the guise that it's a plant. Okay. That makes sense? It does to me because I've, I've learned from you in the past okay. but I think it might be a little over the head of our, of our, of our audience so we'll spend an entire um, day together talking about the, the, uh, the, the hangout together uh, discussing the nutrients within a plant. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I know it's important for us to understand nutrients within our system so that we can uh, uh, convert the, the, those nutrients into energy within the cell. Because really that nutrients in general, food, is the fuel that we have to convert to energy within our system. You know, we have a system here that God gave us that, that converts uh, uh, fuel into energy and creates waste. Those three things you and I will be talking about uh, daily, or when we have these hangouts together. So back to aging and energy and oxygen. Um, okay. Let's. Uh, I apologize for distracting us. You're fine. Uh, without oxygen, the cell dies. Correct. It's very very quick. It's called senescence in in the language of of science. Okay. So they, they, let's talk in the language of our audience. Okay, you don't get oxygen, you die. There you go. Very quick. And if you if you can't deliver the oxygen to the cell, it dies. And so the whole question then boils down to: We thrive on energy. Without action, energy, we do nothing. That energy is produced by ATP. If you circumvent the ATP, like circumventing the plant, and go over here to uh, stimulants, i.e. caffeines and sugars and things like that, then what you have done is, is created a, an adrenaline-like movement in your body. And so many people are thriving off of adrenaline to where the immune system is compromised because of how we've gone about energy. And anybody can Google ATP, adenosine triphosphate is what it means. But they can Google this and it'll just come up and say 95% of all of the energy of the body is made via ATP. Okay. And so if you say, well, I don't want to do that, then it takes certain nutrients to, to uh, enter the mitochondria of the cell to produce the ATP. And if you want to bypass that uh, using the stimulants, then what you've done is you've short-circuited the health of the, of the cell, and then the cell dies. So what we have found in the, in the language now in science is cell junk. So we're using highly processed foods, 
we're using sugars. And in that combination, the stuff can't be removed from the cell. And when the cell is contaminated with junk, it dies. And there's no energy. And we can't live with that. With that. Is there um, the possibility that that cell reproduces differently and, and, and um, <clears throat> actually reproduces itself as a mutated cell, cell? As a mutated cell? And well, there's some we science call, to support we, that. What do we call mutated cells when they're reproducing in the body? Sicker cells. Mm, we can. I was thinking of the C word, because isn't cancer mutated cells? Well, the, the cancer thing, and, and again, in 1931, you keep doing doing this rabbit thing with me, Steve. Uh, okay. Well, it's fine. In, in 1931, a guy by the name of Wahlberg won the Nobel Prize for the discovery that cancer will not live where there's oxygen. I thought it was it would not live in a in an alkaline system. Well, that's part I thought of it acid. Also. Acid, okay, is a part of, but it's his whole thing was oxygen. So if you increase, and by the way, sugar is a food for cancer. I know that. I, I know that. Okay. I don't think that the world knows that, and the uh, everyday even even um, health world is not coming out and saying sugar is a food for cancer. Well, it, it might be that there's an enormous amount of profit in cancer. It might be. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want that to get out. But there is a few. I was called by the uh, somebody promoting funds for cancer the other day. And it was one of those things. He said, would you please do this and such? Uh, send out the letters to your neighbor. And I said, well, you know, would, would, it, would it not make sense that if there was knowledge that if you had oxygen in tissue and lack of sugar, the cancer won't live in that environment. In other words, by what we eat, we create an environment for disease to not live in or to live in. That's kind of a simple equation. And if you create, we know, an alkaline mode, okay, uh, disease won't live in that. Whereas in an acidic mode, that's where disease is harbored. Right. If it's that simple, then why don't we eat according to uh, a program that produces an alkaline body? Well, now the whole thing, from from my advantage point, uh, if the pH of the blood has to be 7.3 to 7.45, that means slightly alkaline. The minute that pH drops down, we invite disease to come in. Absolutely. Okay. Now the blood circulates through the whole of the body roughly three and a half times a minute. Now, the crazy thing about this, I just want to throw this out, is if you add a pound of fat, it creates about seven miles of vessels to run the blood through it to deposit waste in it, if you will. Seven miles. That means your heart beats that much harder because it's got to move that blood through that given mileage. And that's why you hear physicians say, if you lose some weight, meaning fat, you can shrink the mileage of the blood through. Now, all of this becomes kind of part of our equation in terms of producing ATP. And, and I want to get into that for just a moment because this energy turnover, when we're talking about three phosphate molecules all attached, and when the inulin breaks off, in that bond is where we create the energy. So we have to bring that phosphate and tie it back on to go from adenosine diphosphate to adenosine triphosphate. Right. And that's the energy. That happens millions of times per second per mitochondria. Now, let's move that over into energy. The heart only has 700 molecules of ATP in it at any one time. And if your heart rate is 60 beats a minute, there's enough ATP to run your heart for 10 seconds. In your heart at any one time. And that's as but much the as blood and is circulating through and bringing in more nutrients, bringing new things to the cell. The blood is also evacuating waste uh, from those cells mm -hmm. because the cell is the engine. So you have fuel going in one side of the cell or to be uh, uh, 
processed, and, and of course I'm using simple terminology in one side out the other, and we know it's, it's all around, but uh, you know, fuel goes in one side, a reaction happens within that cell, which causes energy, which causes life, and then uh, the, the waste goes out the other side. So we have our arteries that bring in oxygen and fuel, and we have our veins that take away, and we process that, and then we have to evacuate that um, uh, waste in our system. We have urination and our skin and our lungs and all these ways to get the, uh, the waste out of our bodies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a lot of those same systems bring energy and uh, not energy, but fuel in to our, to our, to our systems. That's true. Um, so we have a, um, an ability to bring in um, tons and tons of energy, and we have the ability to uh, get rid of tons and tons of energy, all in one process. Um, how does uh, my system, which I am you know, considered morbidly obese, and I am 70 pounds over what the chart says I should be, versus you, who are uh, several years older than I am, several, and then several, and then several more. Probably double. Um, uh, but yet you're in incredible physical shape. You run up and down mountains daily, and, and um, or hike up mountains and run down them. There you go. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> um, here in Western Colorado. Um, so tell me about that energy production. Well, first of all, it's a discipline. It's, it comes over here, Steve. Yeah, have enough. We're plugging in our computer, as you might know. You might see it. You got it? Okay. Oops. The, the, uh, the choice of how I get my energy um, is a discipline. And, and the discipline comes from how do I want to live? In fact, yeah, as we drink, well, I'm drinking it too. There's nothing wrong with it. It's, we can drink a whole ton of it. Um, your, your cup's smaller than that. <laughs> The, the idea, the question was asked by Socrates writing Gaishin in uh, the Republic, 500 BC. He questioned then, how should man live? And uh, it was before that that Solomon, uh, writing in the book of Proverbs, wrote in, in Psalms, said, how then should man live? How can a young man keep his ways pure? Uh, and we jump all the way forward to the to the 20th, 20th century, and there's a guy by the name of Schaefer who wrote a book and said, how then should we know? So the question is generational. Every person has to bring his compass, his moral compass, and his biochemical compass, and say, okay, this is what, how I know I'm supposed to live. Do I want to do that? Or not? Is there freedom in living in accordance to biochemical and spiritual laws? And there are, or instructions, I should say. So your freedom and my freedoms are measurable. I chose to be free. And your bondage comes from making choices that cause you the overweight. I think last week we talked about discipline. Mm -hmm. And um, so what you're saying is that because you are more disciplined to those instructions and uh, wisdoms of the past, wisdoms of Solomon, wisdoms of, of Psalms, wisdoms of, of uh, Proverbs and, 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 and the Word, as well as some books and teachings, you have more freedom because you're more disciplined. And I have less freedom because I'm less disciplined. Well, discipline begets freedom. Interesting. So, you know, in, in mine, I looked at it and uh, I was raised in a given way and I broke away from that and decided differently and there, there there was a time in my life uh, the word in Hebrew is tet it's the eighth letter in the Hebrew alphabet but it, it really begins to manifest itself when it says I looked at myself and I didn't like what I saw and I'm doing this I'm saying I I thought about I thought about my ways and I changed immediately I didn't carry, I did it immediately. Now, that immediate part wasn't really immediate for me. I began to change incrementally, and that was about 20 years ago. And 
in this number of years and it's escalated because of what I experienced in terms of freedom from where I, I decided to change, uh, loaded with, with arthritic issues, loaded with, you know, not really a whole lot of obesity, but I was carrying 10, 12, 15 pounds more than I wanted to. And I couldn't do what I wanted to do physically in terms of walking and running. And it was at that time that I absolutely sit down and said, do I want to continue the next 20 or 30 or however long on earth in this shape? And I made that decision of, all right, how should I then work? And I looked at myself and I based it on uh, the pH of the blood and said, all right, if you eat certain foods when they metabolize, they leave this as an ash. And when you eat other foods, they they leave an alkaline ash. And it was a very, very easy thing to make. How much better do I feel? I, you know, and, and part of this thing is cognitive issues. People my age are concerned with their memories. And, and, and I did not want, you know, my father died from Alzheimer's. And I looked at that, and I, I can remember a number of years ago watching this whole thing come into play. And I said, under no conditions do I want to find myself in that position again. So if that's the case, then I need to figure out what it means to me not to do that. And the freedom now, when I hear so many people that are you know 50 years of age and, and older, they start talking about their senior moments. Hmm. That is so much garbage, it hurts. Hmm. You know, you, no place do I know of. In, if you do certain uh, nutritional things, you can absolutely open up all of the news to your brain. And there is no reason for people to go down that road and say, I'm having a senior moment. That is, that is one of those functions that that we are looking for a reason not to perform. Okay. So, um, what I'm going to touch on, because we, we've kind of already gone down this road, um, and we're in that rabbit hole uh, deeply now, is most people, when they go to the doctor, know what their blood type is. The doctor, will, you, know, you know, will tell them, um, you know, some of the things that are going on in an examination. And I'm, I'm 47 years of age, and I cannot remember my doctor ever telling me what the pH of my blood was. Well, <clears throat> allopathic medicine subscribes to a... Allopathic. Western medicine. Okay. Subscribes to a, a certain regimen of science. Naturopathic medicine subscribes to the exact, exact opposite. We are in the preventive mode where allopathic medicine, and, you know, and, and they're rightfully right, uh, the undisciplinedness of Western people, they need to be able to continue doing what they're doing without pain. And that's what drugs do. Okay. They allow a person, and so your physician looks at you and says, this is what you, you need to do to eliminate the pain. And they, frequently anymore, you're hearing you need to change your diet. Okay, to what? And that's where things begin to get a little hazy. When we begin, from my perspective, and by the way, there are folks in the in the natural side of things that, that get a little fuzzy with how they go about life too. Um, it is a simple program for me. I, I'm a creationist. Okay, God created us. Yeah. In his image. In his image. And he said it wasn't good. It was really good. It's awesome. And <laughs> then he sat down and he said, here's how, if you want to live freely, here's how you need to function. So in, in so many cases that I've been around, man wants to say, well, we can't do that because that's expensive to eat this way. So we're going to come over here and make you do it the way we want. And I sit there and say, well, oh, gosh, if we're created, why don't I go over here? and do it the way that my Yeshua Messiah wanted me to do it. And that made it easy for me because all of the rule books have been written. The instructions are there. You need to eat this way. Uh, writing in the book of Deuteronomy, 
it laid out a very interesting case in covenant form. If you will do this, I will do this. And one of the words that jumped out at me uh, as I was plowing through this said, now, if you choose not to eat the things I want you to eat, then I'm going to bless you. And he went down through a list of things. But what jumped out at me was this word inflammation. Mm. Where there's inflammation, there's always disease. So obviously, if we eliminated inflammation, you eliminate the environment that disease lives in. Well, and I understand that inflammation is the cause of the mind you know, as well. Always. So I just, you know, it was a very easy thing for me to decide to do. If that's the case, why don't I eliminate the environment? What does it take to do that? And it takes time. And, and then you get into the emotional side. We are emotional eaters. Yeah. And that means we're going to live in a world of stress. So it's not as though I can eliminate the stress from your life. But what we might be able to do is through diet, change how you respond to it. That becomes interesting because you and I are always going to face those moments when the adrenal glands dump a bunch of glucose to give you that flight or fight thing. But that doesn't mean that you need to live in that mode. Okay. So if if you come in as an as in an office and you're all agitated, I could look at you and I could get agitated, or I could just say, you know, Steve, let's let's give that a moment and calm down. So it's how I'm going to respond as to whether I get that flight or fight mentality or whether I deal with it in a very straightforward way. So I'm going to take that that, that sentence you just created and, and try to turn it into a learning experience. What you're saying, it's not how I come into the room or what happens to you. It's how you respond to what happens to you, whether or not stress is created. True. So you have control over your stress, not me. True. So if you're in a healthy environment, both emotionally and physically, mm -hmm. and we're going to eventually talk about spiritually and financially. You bet. But if we're in a healthy, controlled state, emotionally and physically, then I and my anger or my uh, angst or my um, agitation cannot truly affect you. I may approach you, but your reaction and your response to that is your choice, not mine. That's true. Life is choice. So you probably very familiar with, with uh, Victor Frankl, who mm -hmm. wrote the book, um, A Man's Search for, for Meaning. And that's basically the, pre the, the precedent of his entire book, is that if there's meaning in life, if, there's a, if, there's, if I within myself have a reason for life, then I will live. We call it purpose. Purpose. Good word. I think that's in the, the, the word of God somewhere. Um, the, um, uh, you know, so, so just using that, that, that book, Victor Franklin, I recommend everyone uh, read that book. It's, it's, it's uh, touching. The, so stress is based on what we do with the circumstances around us and, and, and presented to us. Stress is, um, you know, is, is actually in a, uh, a physics term. When you push against something that does not move, you create stress. Or you push against something that has resistance, you're creating stress. So, you know, it takes energy to to uh, affect stress. You know, there's uh, it can take a lot of energy if if you've got stress uh, to push something up a hill. That stress, that word, that that uh, physical term. Um, um, physics term mm -hmm. is something that in the mid 50s, if I'm not mistaken, was applied to, to emotions. Oh, because really, you know, if you go back to to um, all the writings in in the 1800s, we never said, you know, um, uh, George Washington, while in Valley Forge, was dealing with stress as the snow fell and he. Uh, prepared his armies for war. I don't believe in the in the uh, in all of the 
1800s and all the readings from those times and, and back into 2000 years ago, some wonderful writings that I read daily, uh, the word stress as an emotion came up. Well, it probably didn't need to come up. <laughs> well, the word fear did. Well, is fear maybe just another word for stress? Well, it's, how, it's a reaction. Okay. If there is, obviously, if, if you're being chased by uh, an animal, you, you, need, you need some adrenaline. Absolutely. And it has to be. I like that. Uh, without that, or, or you need to be with somebody that's a slower runner. <laughs> Darn, Steve, you had to run that in again. Yeah. So if, if that's the case, then you need, to, you need to be able to do something very, very quick in right now. Uh, but that's a good fear. And there's, that's good stress. That makes you act right now. And that cortisol that creates that adrenaline in our system is designed to get us to move now and react to, to what's happening. You know, that, 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 that uh, predator is chasing us across the, the, the forest. We need to get up a tree or we're dead. Um, and there's so, no need so, for anything. So, and then so that cortisol hits our system. It shuts down our, our immune system because we don't need to worry about immunity if we're going to be eaten today. Mm -hmm. It shuts down our uh, process of food because we don't need to worry about digestion if we're going to be eaten right now. It shuts down our need to um, reproduce. So if, you know, because we're not going to need to reproduce if we're eaten today. So some of those reactions that happen in our body on a continual basis um, uh, get shut down when cortisol is heightened so that we can react and respond and get up that tree. The example I'll use is, is um, a lion in savannah of Africa, you know, raises his head and sees a gazelle. The gazelle is eating grass. And um, the, the uh, gazelle raises its head and sees the lion. The gazelle immediately, when it sees the lion, it stops eating, its, its throat shuts closed, it may um, have, have explosive urination and, and, and um, uh, feces loss, so it can get across the savanna really fast. Its hair tightens, its muscles tighten, and it starts moving. The lion sees the, the gazelle. Its, its, its cortisol gets tightened. Its muscles tighten. It stops thinking about the, the female lion that's, that's across the, the, the uh, field. It stops thinking about anything except that gazelle, and it starts going after. So the action of, excuse me, the only problem with that is usually the female is the predator. Uh, and it feeds the male. Uh, that's a good thing. Um, anyway, I guess I, I'm trying to use something that I learned from a different uh, series of, of education um, in that cortisol is designed to create energy immediately, but it's also designed to leave our system within 15, 30 seconds of after its deployment. And, and, and our um, uh, uh, parasympathetic system allows us to cause, uh, to calm down. So we have the sympathetic system, which activates and we move, and then we have the parasympathetic system, which allows us to, 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 to calm down and, and get back to what we were focused on before. And if our sympathetic system is always heightened, and our parasympathetic system is not activating, we're never getting a chance to relax, we're never getting a chance to recover. Stephen, you know, you, you've you exhibited some knowledge here about the human body. Now tell me, this is a little bit aggressive on my part, you're overweight. I am. Knowing that, why would you make the decisions to eat the way you did? Uh, you know, I make those decisions continually, Steve. I make them daily. Um, this morning, I, I had a wonderful uh, protein shake with with uh, the the uh, pearl, and I mixed in a little chia seed and I mixed in some some wheatgrass. Um, but this is after you got overweight. It was after I got overweight. So the point is, is what did you do to get to that position? I ate what was in front of me, what was cheap and convenient in my mind. Um, I followed. Um, the societal uh, teachings and not teachings of, of, uh, 
at my things and um, no, I, I, so you become disciplined in the last church. They say I'm not I'm disciplined enough. This. I I'm I'm, I'm I'm truly not. I am more disciplined than I was. Okay. But I still choose. Uh, We're sitting here at a very long table. You know. We are. And from here to the other end of this is quite a journey. It's eight feet. Okay. So, from my viewpoint, if we take a little bite of here. Just a little change. Pretty soon we'll be at the other end, and that's this journey that that I did a number of years ago. And it's the journey that you started within the last month or two, whatever it was. The journey of a thousand miles starts with one step. But, but this is the whole question with people: Do they need to make this incredible change that will get them immediately down there? I'm telling you, it will hurt. We don't want people to be troubled like that. I made some decisions that altered what I was doing. Uh, and it took me about a week or so to, to look, recover from that. But the journey got easier and easier and easier. Now to go back to my old style of eating, I couldn't do it. Hmm. And that's what people need to really need to understand. We start here, and we make little changes, uh, things that are difficult. Some people aren't going to just really argue with quitting smoking. Absolutely. And it's I so did difficult. for 30-plus years, okay. and I am now a non-smoker. And I'll tell you, it was, it was a decision that I made one time that I finally made that decision in my heart and not in my head. But it took a thousand tiny decisions along the way to get to that big decision and I'm, I'm blessed to know that um, I was able to make that decision um, and, and have discipline the freedom my <laughs> word of what I created in my life um, but we're gonna need to wrap this up we've been on this for a little over an hour now wow. and um, uh, what, what I need to, to say is as the host and as the uh, walk to success.com is walk to success is based on that first step is based on the Kaizen theory of small, continual, incremental improvements. Not uh, always a huge um, step, not always uh, you know, change today. It is literally small incremental decisions along the way. If you choose not to have one candy bar this week, you're a healthier man. If you choose to take the stairs one time this entire month, you're a healthier man. And you can make those choices slowly because what happens, in my opinion, is that when you make that choice uh, to follow the disciplines that we know are right, we have a good amount of hearts, we know what's good and bad, we know in general that if we eat well and exercise, we're going to have health. Um, if we make a choice that way, then uh, we get a little dopamine squirt in our brain and our body reacts and thank you, and we can have gratitude. And that's another strong emotion, and we get to, we get a win. We get a little win with one good decision. Yeah, I might make 10 bad decisions today, but if I make one good decision, it's going to lead me to tomorrow to possibly make two good decisions. And those good decisions in our world, and what we discussed today, is discipline. Mm -hmm. And that discipline creates fruit. Let me, let me, since we're kind of on the subject, and we're all, we're all uh, grown up, I just want people in your audience to take a look at their body as in a mirror and say, do I like what I've built? And, and then whatever age you are, I'm going to go into the next 20 years in this outfit, this tent, this house that I've built. The second letter in the Hebrew alphabet is that, meaning house. So you're going to build the house that you're going to live in. Do you like it? Thank you. Um, and, and Dr. Stevens, uh, Stephen uh, Wilson here. Uh, Dr. Stevens, I don't know who that is. I did. Dr. Steve Wilson, um, thank you so much for today. Uh, thank you for your reference. Uh, so everybody can, can see that is Psalm, Psalms 119, mm -hmm. where um, uh, the, the psalmist took uh, the, the Hebrew alphabet and put a description to every letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It's a um, 
It starts with an A type of Al poem. Aleph. Aleph is the first word. No, but the type of poem it is. Oh, I don't um, Anyway, uh, Psalms 119, uh, we refer to, to Proverbs today. Uh, we refer to Deuteronomy. Um, you and I, um, would, would, uh, well, I, I know that I want to give thanks to God for having the ability to come here and talk to these folks, folks today. Uh, I pray for uh, their health and I pray for my health and I pray for the strength to have discipline, to be a healthier, more vibrant man uh, so that I can sit here in 20 years and talk to a younger man and give him some of my wisdom and share with him uh, the same wisdom that was written over 4,000 years ago in the Torah that, uh, you know, how good precepts we can follow. It, it'll be in everybody's advantage if they do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And it's going to take a minute for this to stop recording.